All right, one more hand. Looking outside and so, uh, to the clergy, Reverend Relford, Reverend Smith, Pastor Isom, Pastor Banks, thank you. Pastor Banks, I thank you for this opportunity to, to preach the word one more time. I thank you for your, your leadership the years that I've been here. The Pleasant Green Congregation, thank you for having me in an environment where I can grow and checking on me and my family and, and providing that loving environment. Sister Destiny, thank you. You've been so supportive through this walk. You've gotten into a lot of things that I don't think you bargained for, but I thank you for sticking with it. She's so supportive that she moved up from the, from the pew that she was in all the way up to the front. And then, I don't, 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 don't clap too much though, because I know there's an ulterior motive in that. If I start acting a fool, she can give me the side eye. <laughs> no, but I, I thank you, Sister Destiny. The Lord has given me a word from Ephesians chapter 3. And we'll start in verse 14 with Paul's prayer for the church of Ephesus. Verse 14. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. If you can follow along with me, we'll go from uh, verse 14 to verse 16. And it reads, When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray from that his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Let me just read verse 16 again. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Today I'd like to come to you with a, uh, from the topic of empowered by the right power source. Empowered by the right power source. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we just thank you for today, Lord. We just thank you for this worship experience, Lord. We just thank you because it's not because we are so good, Lord. It is because your grace and your mercy that you allow us to be here, Lord. And I just thank you for this opportunity to preach your word, Lord. It's not because I am so smart or so gifted, Lord. It's because you have pointed me in the right direction, Lord, in your grace and your mercy that you allow me to get up here with you despite all my faults, Lord. And I just pray today, Lord, that I will preach your message accurately and boldly, Lord. Lord, I pray that I will decrease, Lord, so that you may increase, Lord. And I pray that the lips, the words of my mouth, and the meditation of my heart is pleasing to you, Lord. And I pray that it will glorify your name and edify the body, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Empowered by the right body source. From the, from the right power source. My wife and I recently went to go see the movie Hidden Figures. And if you if you don't know about it, it's, uh, it's about three African-American women who, who work behind the scenes to help the United States get into space in the 1960s. Right. And, and if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to, to take the opportunity to go see it because it is a little known fact or a little known story about American history. So I encourage you to go check it out. But, but as someone who works in computers, there was, there was another aspect that interested me about this movie. Uh, you know, one of the things that, were, that was interesting to me was when NASA was looking to replace their human computers. And, and back at that time, a, a human computer was someone who would work to solve complex mathematical equations. And at this time, uh, the, the United States was competing with Russia to see who could get up to space first. So they wanted some faster computer, or some faster computation, so they looked to get a machine to solve their problems faster. See, in, in, in the movie, NASA bought their first computer, an IBM 7090. This was a, an old mainframe computer. And it was, at that time, it, it was a powerful machine, but it could only perform mathematical computations. And, and it was interesting because this computer was massive. It took up an entire room. And it, and it required a team of engineers just to, just to set it up and turn it on. And I, I was looking at the cost of that machine, and at that time, in, in the 1960s, this was $2.9 million. I looked it up uh, and to see what that would equate to in, in 2016, and that would cost roughly $24 million today. So this was a, a big, expensive machine that would do simple computations. 
and it, and it really made me think about how far we've how far we've come in the last 60 years with technology. You see, back in the day, this, this, this simple mainframe computer could do one task and do it really well and do it really fast. It required engineers to operate it and it, and it cost a lot of money. But, but nowadays, in, in what we call the digital age, computers are, are cheaper, they're, they're smaller, and, and we even see babies operating iPads and, and computers. Yeah. It's amazing how far we've come with technology. And they become so cheap and so small that we see computers everywhere. A lot of families have their own personal computer, they have their own laptop, they have uh, tablets, we have computers embedded in our cars, computers embedded in our homes, we have video game systems that we play, they're, they're literally everywhere. And in fact, they're so cheap and small, I, I would think it would be a challenge to find someone who does not carry a small computer in their, in their pocket or in their purse. We, we may refer to it as a, a cell phone or a smartphone. You know, that, that's really a computer. And, and these computers today, it's, they're, they're small, they're cheaper, and they do so much more than those big mainframes from back in the day. I just, I just think about my cell phone. I not only use it to make calls. In fact, it seems like calling is, the, is, the, is one of the least, off, least frequent things I do on the phone. See, I, I, I have a calculator on there. I, I can search the internet on there. I can send text messages to someone halfway across the world. I can get um, mail through it. I can, I can watch music videos, I can watch any type of video, I can listen to music, I can synchronize my calendar, keep all my phone uh, contacts in there, and I can use it for GPS when I get lost. There's a, there's a lot of features in these small little computers today. And, and as, as awesome as that was, as I was thinking, you know, I got to really thinking about something that we really don't consider that much. Something that arguably is the most important part, and that is the, the power source. The, the power supply. If you think about it without the power source, without the power supply, your, your device is not going to do anything. Yeah. The specs can list out all these awesome things that it can do, but you can't do anything without the right power supply. The, the, the purpose of the power supply is to provide enough electricity um, for, for the device to run. And it's really important that it's designed properly because if we look at the, the case of the Samsung Galaxy Note, it's blowing up. I know it had a lot of features on that Samsung, but I don't, I don't think explosive device was one of them. That it was, it was so bad that you couldn't even get on the, on the plane with your, with your Samsung. Not only that, it needs to provide the right amount of power. And I don't know about you, but it seems like I can charge my phone all night, all day, but it never has the right power when I need it. Right. My wife calls me and be like, don't you have your cell phone on? Do you have your cell phone on you? I, I do, but it, it don't have your power. <laughs> so without the right power, without the right power supply, your device is useless. And, and I guess what, I, what I'm trying to say is that having the right power source means the difference between having a dead device and a live device. Having the right power source means that you are more likely able to use the device when you really need it. Having the right power source will greatly enhance your experience with the device. Uh, so, I mean, I, I didn't come here to give you a, a, a talk about devices and batteries, so what am I really getting at? Well, in this life, regardless of how well we have things together, regardless of how well we may be, we need to make sure that we have the right power source. See, the right power source makes sure that we have life. The right power source will give us the endurance to persevere in any situation. The right power source will enable us to handle way more than we ever thought we could. It's important that we have the right power source. So, so what is this power source? Well, I came to talk to you today about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the power source that the Christian needs to be powered by. And then this was Paul's prayer for the church of Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 3. See, Paul wrote this epistle to encourage the church. He, he wanted to give them some more instruction. And, and earlier in chapter 3, Paul acknowledges that he's been having some, some trials and tribulations of his, of his own. And maybe that's an understatement because Paul was a prisoner in Rome at this time. He was on house arrest. He was actually chained to a Roman soldier, making sure that he didn't get away. And, and if, you, if you think about this, Paul was a prisoner for doing God's will. He was a prisoner for going and sharing the gospel message that he shared to the church of Ephesus. He was in prison for doing what God had told him to do. 
Now, if, if you can imagine, we've got to put ourselves in the, in the shoes of the church of Ephesus. That can be pretty discouraging, right? Right, we have Paul who is there, who's there, a preacher who helped establish the church, who is their friend, spent a lot of time with them in chains, in prison. And, and, and it's even more distressing when you think about the reason he was there. He wasn't doing anything wrong. He was just preaching the message. Amen. Furthermore, it, the church of Ephesus is, is, is relatively young in this case. So, so you're saying, Paul, that I need to accept this message. I need to accept Christ and go out and do Christ's will. And you're in jail for that? Uh -huh. That's got to be discouraging. <laughs> and, and, and this is the reason that Paul prays. He, he doesn't want them to, to get down. He doesn't want them to, to be discouraged. In, in verse 14, that's why he says he falls to his knees and he prays. Amen. And, and, and I like this because not only does he fall to his knees and he, not only does he pray, he prays to God the Father, the creator of all things in, in heaven and on earth. In, in, in Paul's low moment, in his time of need, he humbled himself and called out to the Father. And just like our Sunday school lesson said, it is the Father that created all things. Not just, not just me and you. Not just the, the beasts in the field. Not just the birds in the air. Not just the, the fish in the sea. Not just the planets. Not just the sun. Not just the moon. But everything. The angels even created your enemies. He created everything. And it reminds us that in our times of need, in our, in our low moments, we need to reach out to the Father. We need to reach out to the one that created everything. And, and he created everything just by speaking. Yes. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to go to anyone, I want someone that can create just by speaking. So we need to go to the person that has power. But, but that's, that's not all. That's not all. Paul prays that from God's glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Uh, now, now, let, now let's unpack this a little bit. Paul speaks of the, the glorious unlimited resources, meaning that not only did God create everything, not only is he the one that initiated everything, but he still owns it. God is sovereign ruler of everything, and, and he can organize things in the way that he sees fit. He has power over all creations. And it's from this from this resource, from these resources that he can use to empower or strengthen someone. Yeah, and, and it goes on, and, and Paul says, from these, from these resources, I pray that God will empower or strengthen or make you stronger with your inner spirit through, through the spirit. So, so what is Paul talking about, this, this inner strength? He's talking about the, the, the spirit of the human, the spirit of man. And, and sometimes we need strengthening. Sometimes we're going to go through some challenging moments. Sometimes we're going to go through some difficult seasons. And, and, and the, the reason for those seasons may be different. Sometimes it may be the world trying to knock you down. And you're doing everything you can, but you get that layoff. You're doing everything you can, but you can't seem to put food on the table. You're doing everything you can, but you keep running into oppression. Sometimes it can be the world. Sometimes it may be demons or Satan himself. But let's be real with ourselves. Let's be real. Sometimes Satan ain't got anything to do with it. Sometimes the world ain't got anything to do with it. Sometimes it's our own poor choices. We didn't need to be with that person. We didn't need to be with that man. We had no business being with that woman. We had no business being in that place we're in. So now we have some trouble. Sometimes we cause our own challenges. And sometimes, just like the Apostle Paul, we may run into challenges because we're following God's word. We are doing what he told us to do. we got to remember that Yes, we are Christians. Yes, God has promises. Yes, he's blessing us. But we're operating in a fallen world. We're operating in, in a world that is ruled by Satan, ruled by the enemy. So we're going to have some problems, Christian. Whatever the source of the difficulty, though, regardless of the source, regardless of where it comes from, a, a season of tribulation, a season of trouble can, can, can really weigh down on your spirit. It can really break you down. And, and this is a, a dangerous spot to be in because this is where the enemy will attack. This is where the enemy will, will try to give you a spirit of separation and, and try to separate, separate you from the Lord. This is a, a, a time where, the, where the, the enemy will try to give you a spirit of depression, a, a spirit of, of loneliness, a spirit of despair, of, of sadness, of anger, fear, emptiness, or hate. Yes. That's a state that we need to stay away from. Yes. Yes. It's a state of being defeated. So we need to be strengthened to stay away from this, to stay connected. Paul says that God 
can administer inner strength through the Holy Spirit. So let's, let's, let's talk about that. But first things first, if God is going to administer something through his Holy Spirit, we need to make sure that we possess the Holy Spirit first. Because God can't bless through something if you don't possess that thing. In other words, you need to possess the Holy Spirit, meaning you need to be alive. And God can't bless you like he wants to bless you if you're spiritually dead. Uh, let, me, let me help you out. Let me help you out here. In, in Romans, it talks about all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It talks about the wages of sin is death. Meaning that if we're in our sin state, if we are in our sin nature, we are dead. We are just dead men walking. We need to get the Spirit. Roman, Romans 8, 9 says that if we don't possess the Holy Spirit, we do not belong to Christ. So, so how do we belong to Christ? How do we get life? How do we receive the Holy Spirit? Well, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, When you believe in Christ, He identified you as having His own by giving you the Holy Spirit. Meaning, if we go back to Romans, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised you from the dead, you will be saved, you will have life, you will have the Holy Spirit. So we need to get the Holy Spirit. We need to possess the Holy Spirit. So now that we have the Holy Spirit, how can the Lord bless us through the Holy Spirit? Well, we need to understand some things about the Spirit. We need to understand some of His characteristics. See, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18 says that it is by the Spirit that we have access to God the Father. Meaning that without the Spirit, we cannot talk to our Father, the Creator of all things. The Word from God comes through the Spirit, and we pray to God, we speak to God through the Spirit. And John, 14, John chapter 14, verse 16 gives us a lot more information about the Spirit. It says that he is an advocate. Some translations say he's a helper. He, he's a comforter. He acts on our behalf. He intercedes for us with God, the Father. And it says that the Spirit will never leave you. And, and, and this is backed by, by 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, where it says that the, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. Now, if something dwells within you, that means it's going to go everywhere that you go. In other words, if I can say this another way, like Bobby Brown said, that every little step you take, the Holy Spirit's going to be there with you. The Holy Spirit will always be by your side. And, and, and another thing that this reminds us is that because the Holy Spirit dwells within us, we can't just be going anywhere that we like. Amen. We can't just take God to anywhere. We need to, we need to be mindful of where we're going. And that also means that we're not coming to church to be in the presence of the Spirit. The Spirit's within you. The church is for worship. But the Spirit is within you 24-7, 365, going everywhere that you go. So... Let's remember that we have the Spirit within us and be honoring the Spirit at all times. But I, but, I, but I digress, I digress. Regardless of your situation, it says that the comforter, the, the helper, the, the advocate will not leave you. So even at our lowest, even when we feel lower than dirt, when we feel that we can't go any lower, we can count on the faithfulness of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the, the Bible says that we can grieve the Spirit, but the Spirit will never leave us. We can grieve Him by, by doing things that are against the will of God. But thank God for the grace and mercy of, of the Holy Spirit that He will never leave us. He is faithful. It also speaks of the, the Holy Spirit leading us to truth. John 16 verse 13 tells us that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He does not speak on His own accord. Everything that He speaks, He, he speaks what He hears from the Father. Amen. And, he, and he teaches and he explains spiritual truths that come from the Father that, that are beyond human understanding. Because let's be honest, I know, I know I'm guilty of this. When I'm in a situation, I'm going to try to use my own reasoning, my own logic, my own power to get out of something. But it's through the Holy Spirit that we can get the, the perspective of the Creator and, and attack it in a godly manner. The, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And, and not only that, the Holy Spirit helps us to pray. In, in Romans 8.26, it says that in our weakness, we wouldn't know what to pray for without the Holy Spirit. And then let me help you out with this. I know there was, there was a time when I was low on my money, and I used to pray to God, God, give me some more money. And he said to me, look, you need to, you need to steward your money properly. Right. You're spending it in the wrong places. Maybe you should tithe first. Maybe you don't need everything that you're purchasing. You should put your money in the right places. So pray for a spirit of stewardship. Amen. Amen. 
even, and, and I know sometimes when I'm in situations, I know I need help, but I really don't know what to say. But the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf, praying for us in utterances that we don't understand to the Father. He, he is constantly interceding for us, praying on our behalf. In, 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 in Ephesians, it, it says that the Spirit is a spirit of unity. Chapter 4, verse 3. It said, and, and it's a spirit of unity. We have a, a vertical unity and a horizontal unity. So what do I mean? A vertical unity meaning that we have unity with God the Father. We have a connection with God the Father. We have a connection with Jesus Christ. Through the Holy Spirit, we have a connection with our Heavenly Father, our Savior. But also we have the horizontal unity. That, that's a, a unity with the church. And, and, and I don't mean the building. Now, in, in, in the Bible, church is translated in, in Hebrew to ecclesia, which means the, the body of believers. So we have a horizontal unity with our believers, with fellow believers. So we can go to our fellow believers and commune with them with our issues, and we can have them intercede for us on our behalf as well. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of unity, but, that, but that's not all. If that doesn't get you excited, the same spirit that dwells within us is the same spirit that empowered Christ during his earthly ministry. And if that ain't something to shout about, I don't know what is. You see, maybe we need to understand what the Holy Spirit empowered Christ to do. See, the, the, it was the same spirit that facilitated the turning of water into wine. It was the same spirit that facilitated miraculous healings. It is the same spirit that enabled Jesus to walk on water. It is the same spirit that enabled multitudes to be fed with two fish and five loaves of bread. It is the same spirit when so many miracles were performed that if they were all written they could not be, the world could not contain all of the books it is the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead That's the Christ. And, and, and it goes on to say that, that God will give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit that dwells within you that means that because Christ raised Christ rose from the grave and Christ defeated death we can also defeat this sinful condition that we're in, we can also defeat our flesh we don't we no longer have a spirit or a, a slave spirit where we're a slave to sin. We can choose to follow the direction of the Holy Spirit and choose the way of God. Amen. He gives us life. He gives life to our mortal bodies. This means also that, that we have a, a, a spirit to overcome any situation for the glory of God. And, and, and finally... The Holy Spirit also helps us to get the, the proper grasp or the, the, the proper disposition of our, of our current state. See, we, we, we need to understand our, our, our real situation. You know, we may have some, some seasons, but the good thing about seasons is that they change. We need to understand our permanent position once we have the Holy Spirit. See, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 tells us that the Holy Spirit is God's guarantee that you belong to Him and that you will inherit His promises. So what are these promises? A promise that you will have eternal life. A promise that you will be conformed to Christ's image. We, that means that we will have eternal fellowship with Him in heaven. The land of no wars. The land of no more death. The land of no more sickness. The land of no more pain. The land of no more crime. The land of no more worry. Of no more stress. We will have fellowship with God in eternity in peace. Amen. And it's a promise that we will have victory because Christ was victorious. Amen. A promise that we will overcome because Jesus overcame. Amen. A promise that we will be ruling with them when he comes to rule. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Right. This is with that, that proper disposition that comes by the Holy Spirit that helps us to realize our permanent position. Yes, that we have a true relationship with the Father. Through our acceptance of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Amen. And with this, we can be filled with joy. We can be filled, we can be content. We can have a spirit of peace in whatever situation the world throws at us. I know that people say that you should strive to be happy. But happy we're, we're, we're striving too low because happiness depends on your current circumstances. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm not happy about my circumstances. What we need to be striving for is joy. Joy is contentment. Joy is, is, is being excited. Joy is being ecstatic whatever your situation because you know your permanent position. A permanent position that can only be provided through the possession of the Holy Spirit. Yes, yes. The helper, the advocate. The Holy Spirit connects us to the Father. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of unity. The same Holy Spirit that empowered Christ. This is how the Holy Spirit can empower us to overcome whatever we may be going through. 
when we have the right power source, when we, when we have the Spirit of God, when we have the Holy Spirit, we can handle any situation that's thrown at us. We can handle situations beyond our natural selves. We can handle situations that a physical person cannot. We just have to rely on the power of the Spirit. We have to be possessed by the Spirit. And, and, and the Lord blessed me. I was trying to think of, a, of an illustration. And, and this brought me back to my days as a professional wrestling fan. Now, I don't know if y'all watch the, the WWE, World Wrestling Entertainment, or, or back in the day when I was young, it was called the World Wrestling Federation. That's oh, okay. right. And back in that day, Hulk, Hulk Hogan was the man. And, and I, was, I was a Hulkamaniac. That was, those were people that were, that were fans of Hulk Hogan. I'm not talking about Hollywood Hogan. I'm not talking about the black and white Hulk Hogan. I'm talking about red and yellow Hulk Hogan. Back in that day, they called him the immortal Hulk Hogan. And, and, and if you can go back with me, if anybody else who watched wrestling back in that day knows, there were some times where Hulk Hogan was in some tough situations. There were some times where he was just getting beat down by the enemy. Hit after hit. They beat him down to his knees. He'd be on his knees taking hits. Hits. But then, Hulk Hogan would get this goofy look on his face. He'd get this goofy look on his face and then he'd get back up. He'd start shaking his head. He'd start shaking his head and say, no. Start waving at the enemy saying, no, you can't do nothing to me, enemy. And that bugs me because that talks about what happens when we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. knocking you down on your knees, but it's just putting you in a position to fight back. Yeah. Yeah. You know that that's the most powerful position on your knees. You can on your knees, you can submit to the body, you can submit to the power that's within you. Yeah. Then you can get back up. You can lift up your enemy and say, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. Bring your finger out of the enemy. Yeah, we have to be possessed by the spirit, like Hulk Hogan was possessed by something. That's, that's not all, that's not all. After this happened, the enemy couldn't hurt Hulk Hogan anymore. And that's when he would go with his, 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 with his finishing move. And the young kids can help me out here. The finishing move is the final move that you, that you use to put your enemy under. See, Hulk Hogan, one of the things I stuck about, about him, is that he had a weak finishing move. As powerful as he was, it was a weak finishing move. See, he would, he would grab his opponent and throw him against the ropes. His opponent would come running back where he had his foot sticking up. <laughs> Just run into someone's foot, be knocked out, and be taken down by a leg drop. That didn't make sense to me, but, but, but the Lord worked on me. He, had, he helped me to understand. You see, God is the creator of all things. He is owner of all things, meaning that he is ruler over your enemy. He's ruler over your situation. So the Lord can work it out to where your enemy is in the proper position to be defeated. Because you don't have to worry about your own power. The Lord will put them in the right position. Maybe you don't believe me. Maybe you don't believe me. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It talks about Satan bruising the enemy's hill. Or bruising Jesus' hill. But Jesus bruising Satan's head. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounded like the big boot to me. Satan ran into the big boot of Jesus and was defeated. Yeah, Satan thought he had him when he put him up on the cross. Satan thought he had him when he died on the cross. Jesus got back up with all power in his head. He got back up and he rose. We got the victory. Jesus got the victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The final thing about Hulkamania, about Hulkamaniacs, see, Hulk Hogan in his interviews, he used to say, what you gonna do, brother? What you gonna do when Hulkamania runs wild on you? And I like that because he wasn't talking about Macho Man. What, what am I gonna do when the Macho Man comes after me? How am I gonna handle the Macho Man? How am I gonna handle Jake the State? How am I gonna handle the Ultimate Warrior? He said, what are you gonna do when Hulkamania runs wild on you? So that tells me, believers, when we're powered by the right power source, when we're powered by the right spirit, we can look at our problems. We, we don't have to say, oh, what am I gonna do if I lose my job? What am I gonna do when I get sick? What am I going to do if this doesn't happen? We can look at our problems and say, what you going to do, Beth? What you going to do, Sid? What you going to do, Ray? What you going to do, depression? What are you going to do, oppression? What are you going to do, haters, when my God runs wild on you? And then, because a Christian can't be defeated by normal means, we got a supernatural power. It's important that when we, 
when we are possessed by the Holy Spirit, when we have the Holy Spirit, yeah. we don't try to take credit for what the Holy Spirit yeah. will help us to do. Yeah. We need to give God His glory when we're able to overcome our situations. Amen. Let us stand on our feet. When I think about the 